Okay, so we're going to take you through um, winners and losers in 2017 and make some forward-looking uh, speculation and predictions about some of these trends and what we see among winners and losers and how we can extrapolate that forward into winners and losers. We did an assessment of the companies that are most frequently mentioned under the category of winners versus losers in our winners and losers videos and then tried to say, is there anything we could suss out in terms of themes that distinguish winners from losers? And as you can see, the same people come up all the time on the positive side and on the negative side. And the thing that the losers have in common is that they're traditional broadcast or broadcast approach companies where they're trying to aggregate an audience and then serve them ads. That we believe that that is a model that is significantly challenged. And it's also not a model that is the pure domain of offline. There's a lot of online media companies that are effectively trying to replicate this algorithm that we think is getting weaker and weaker. And that's user growth times engagement equals an audience that we can interrupt with ads. We think that that is a failed strategy for both offline and online players, and we're gonna talk more about that. What do uh, some of the winners have in common? Uh, we think there is uh, several themes, and one particular that emerges among the companies that we consistently highlight is winners. And the way we think about it, trying to create a, an, an axis, if you will, is on the y-axis we have receptors. And that is your ability to grow an audience, but not only your ability to have that audience, but to put in place these receptors that as a function of their usage of the product, you're able to begin gleaning data and observational uh, patterns that either add to the consumer experience implicitly, really effortlessly, or invisibly behind the scenes, or create a very robust data set for your customer, which oftentimes is the advertiser or someone spending money on the platform to reach the user. On the x-axis, it's intelligence, and that is how robust are you able to incorporate the data from those receptors, how fluidly, how, how um, innovatively are you able to circulate it back into the consumer offering or the offering to your customer. So, an example, magazines have neither a lot of receptors, they're small audiences, nor are they that iterative or that intelligent with the usage of the data that's created by the usage of magazines. As you get to outdoor and television, not that intelligent, but a lot more receptors, much larger audiences. Some other folks, subscription. We would argue as subscription-based products have very or have decent intelligence, but not that much scale. Twitter, Pinterest, some of the online players who we think are pursuing this growth of users, but their intelligence is not that strong in terms of iterating this data back to innovation in the end product, are going to be losers. And that is they have been overvalued and they're about to see the same decline that we're seeing in some of the offline broadcast guys. And then the disco part of the quadrant are these companies that are able to not only have huge audiences and really robust receptors, but almost invisibly incorporate these usage patterns and the intelligence they get from the usage back into the end ex user experience, and every day it gets better and better. An obvious example, Uber, that every day takes the implicit data they're getting from you from your trips to enhance the quality of the product. You can see the future of Uber, where it's going. You check in, or you're going, you put in a destination for a restaurant. They perhaps even let you start ordering, or you put in a destination for a mall, and the retailers bid on real estate to try and get you into their specific store when you're at a high-density retail environment. Waze is a perfect example of this, that the data you input immediately just bringing up the app informs the consumer value proposition by, trapping, by tracking traffic and density. And every person, every move you do on Waze immediately upgrades the quality of the end user experience. You can see a lot of opportunities for advertising there. Subscriptions, you would think, are very intelligent, but they typically aren't because they're requesting explicit data. Chanel is asking you to tell them how often you want the product instead of looking at your purchase history and making suggestions. Dollar Shave Club is still asking you how many blades do you want. There's enormous opportunity across traditional consumer brands. I shop the same place, I buy the same damn thing about every 14 weeks in terms of my outfit. At some point, they're just gonna start sending it and leaving it with my doorman and they'll leave a second box saying, send the shit back you don't want. <laughs> Mass customization is not the answer. People don't want to provide input explicitly. They're not intelligent enough 
to know what Nikes they want. There's a small population of people that have that feel, but the majority want you to register in their implicit data. And when you have the Nike running app, register the type of activity you have, register the store you're more likely to go to, and then merchandise to you the exact type of shoe, tell, it, tell you it's reserved for you and waiting at that store, or give you the option to send it to your home or place of work, which is data they have already collected. So Apple initially had this enormous surge in value creation, but the original value creation that surged Apple above $100 billion was in fact an algorithm. It wasn't the iPod. It was iTunes, which is receptors times intelligence. What is the implicit intelligence they gather? The popularity of songs, such that you could go to an album and start cherry picking the one or two songs that everybody else likes, which are typically gonna be the one or two songs you like. However, they have failed to build on that algorithm and have been out algorithmed or implicit intelligence has been stronger on other music streaming services that respond more robustly to your tastes and begin to build implicitly better networks and better stations and they have fallen behind. Amazon's initial booster in terms of getting past a $100 billion market cap was absolutely algorithmically based on intelligence and receptors, specifically in the form of Amazon reviews. People wrote reviews, and that informed purchases, which created this inextricable upward spiral. It informed product purchases, informed their algorithm, which informs their search, which helps you get to the best product. Amazon also has uh, other fantastic intelligence in the form of crawlers who go out and uh, crawl millions of sites to make sure they're either the least expensive option or at least match the least expensive option. Who could be the first trillion dollar company based on this axiom of intelligence times receptors? We're making a bet that it could be Amazon. And I think Amazon's foray into voice gives us a vision of what it could be like. But I think they have effectively figured out a way to create more receptors in our lives such that we can, they can then uh, levy their incredible intelligence to go to what I would call zero-click ordering. I think they're gonna take all shopping decisions out of our life except for the stuff that gives us a lot of joy, which is about three to 5% of our actual shopping. And they're gonna take prime users and turn them into prime plus plus users and take them from $1,300 a year to 13,000. They will announce it and the stock will be taken over a trillion dollars. And we will have pure frictionless e-commerce. Facebook is growing the receptors, probably more receptors than anyone in the world. They use it to inform their customers, their advertisers, by offering targeting that is more robust than anyone in the world. You can buy advertising that targets households in a specific geography that has new teen drivers in the household. That is how strong their intelligence is into grabbing user data implicitly and then informing their advertisers. They jump silos by figuring out if you have on your Facebook page that you graduated from college, that means you're over the age of 21, giving alcohol advertisers the confidence that when they run an ad on Instagram to an individual, that they are in fact over 21, which no other platform is able to do without an explicit, uh, an explicit ask around how old the person is. They are moving to algorithms. Rather than a straight time feed, time is a form of algorithm, but instead they're gonna look at your implicit behavior and they're gonna start organizing your feed based on what you seem to like. Google is the original gangster here. Every time you do a search, you are making the algorithm better because they're serving you listings in the organic feed that is based on the interest and search volume of other people. So to talk about some predictions, we think that if you will, Google's numbers of receptors is flatter in decline, Amazon is growing both receptors and intelligence, Facebook is growing their intelligence, and Apple seems to have lagged in terms of intelligence, not being as deft with implicit user data as some of the other streaming services. So as a result, one of the predictions we're making for 17 is that the current hierarchy of market capitalization, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, is going to flip. And then in 2017, the two most valuable companies in the world will no longer be Google and Apple, but will be Amazon and Facebook. So who are the biggest losers here? I believe Twitter has almost no intelligence, as far as I can tell, other than telling you what's trending. They have done nothing with this incredibly robust data or user set. And I hear from advertisers that the targeting has potential, but doesn't warrant the additional dollars they've been asking for. Twitter has declined by 60% over the last 12 months. I think it is still dramatically overvalued. 
Pinterest, we pick on Pinterest a lot. I think Pinterest has absolutely no intelligence. I can't figure out how this company gets an $11 billion market cap or justifies it relative to its revenue base. I think this is one of the most overvalued companies in the world, maybe with the exception of WeWork, where they've effectively just rented really cool office space and put in a coffee bar and are now worth more than the buildings that they're leasing one floor in. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. But first off, I think these companies in this circle are hugely overvalued. I think the VCs and the people in these companies, when they realize how much money has been raised, and in terms of preferences around what will have to go back to the investors when they're um, eventually sold, I think the common shares or the shares that the employees hold at these companies are effectively worthless. I think Snapchat is going to decline in value in 2017. And that is, we see them as primarily pursuing this old economy model. They're very innovative but they don't seem to be using a lot of intelligence around informing the product for either advertisers or consumers. So I would say that's our quote unquote, you know, real stones or backbone prediction here is we think Snapchat is gonna decline from its current $20 billion market valuation. Now, great, so what does this mean if you're a brand or a CPG player? I think there are, uh, there are things, derivatives you can take away that should inform your business strategy. Specifically, if you think about this as receptors that are out there getting consumer information or behavior and then trying to respond as quickly as possible, as elegantly as possible without interrupting the consumer back into your core business and to create this feedback loop. Fast fashion is really probably the most dramatic value creation or destroyer depending where you are in retail. Retail is effectively a story of Zara and Uniqlo and some of the fast fashion guys taking share and value away from the less agile players. So, where does this head, or what is the analogy for a brand or a retailer? And that is, how do you figure out, as the course of your regular business, how do you put out more receptors out there? Is it through your influencers? Is it through spies? Is it through people with smartphones and fashion shows? And then immediately start to incorporate the intelligence you gather as a function of your customer's purchase history, what's happening in areas of key influence, and immediately incorporate it back into your supply chain, and then collapse the supply chain as quickly as possible. But the world really is gonna be inherited by fast fashion. We're gonna start talking about fast beauty. We're gonna start talking about fast food, not in terms of QSR, but in terms of the CPG brands that are able to respond vis-a-vis -vis receptors most quickly to product trends get their influencers to talk about them, and as a result, come up faster in organic rankings and start to take share from the biggest guys. So in sum, we think there's gonna be a lot of big winners, both offline and online, and a lot of losers, both offline and online, based on who is able to adopt this peanut butter and chocolate axiom of intelligence and receptors. Mm -hmm.